ESPN World Series studio host Mark Kastasher with Armin and Levac on 104.5 The Team. You're home for New York sports. You can hear Kasti right here on The Team throughout the World Series in the studio with his guests as, as they come through pregame and postgame. Kasti, your reaction to the first pitch last night, the inside the park home run, the first pitch from Matt Harvey? To be honest, should have been a long out to center field. I don't know what happened out there. I mean, it seemed apparent that uh, you know, Cespedes and Conforto wasn't sure whose ball it was. Cespedes didn't take charge. And I guess you, you, you maybe, if you want to play official score at home, can determine whether or not maybe there should have been an error on that play or whatever. Whatever happened, you're right. That's, that's the big takeaway is how do we throw Escobar a first pitch fastball ever? And we've been saying this now for two weeks. If everyone knows that the Mets probably shouldn't throw a fastball to the leadoff hitter of the Royals. That was a gaffe by the New York Mets, wasn't it? You know, it's funny because, yes, it would seem so on the surface, but then you just play those mind games. Like, all right, there's no way he's expecting a fastball here. Is he sitting on my secondary pitch? And, you know, but the Mets starters, that's their bread and butter, so maybe they're thinking, all right, he's thinking he's going to get something off speed or, or something with a little bend in it, so maybe he's not looking for the fastball. Um, I'm not sure the mentality of that. I do know this. Uh, Chris Archer of the Tampa Bay Rays is uh, going to uh, bounce into our oh. pregame show coming up tonight. <laughs> I'm definitely going to ask him about the mentality of that, and, and he'll give us an honest answer, I know. I love him. He is <laughs> so good, Mark. Why is he so good at so many things? I don't know. You know, first of all, as Dan Shulman pointed out last night, and I've got the same barber as Shulman, we're jealous of his hair game. We start from right there. <laughs> Amen. And then, you know, the fact that he could, uh, you know, throw a, a baseball as hard as he does, as well as he does, uh, is another thing. And then to walk off the street with essentially no real broadcasting background, go on television in the wild card game on ESPN and, you know, sound so good and make such great cogent points and make them, you know, uh, in such, you know, small amounts of time. It's just perfect. I mean, people spend years trying to do what he's been able to do. And then he came on radio last night uh, in game one, and you could tell he was very aware that he had to lay out on pitches so Dan Shulman could give that information, unlike on TV where you could just have a conversation. So I don't know why he's that good, but uh, I, I'm definitely jealous. Like yes, you, you can ask yeah. Levac whenever he was. Oh, it was it was the wild card game, it was the, Yankees Astros. Yeah, that the, was what, you you develop, Armin developed a man crush on Archer that day. We were at the bar, and I'm just staring at the TV, and you could ask Levac. I walked around to everyone at the bar going, do you understand how young and how good this yeah. guy is right now? Like that was yeah. the mo- that was my biggest takeaway of that whole game. I mean, it would be like any one of us uh, suiting up or, you know, going out to a PGA event, you know, and, and knocking in a couple of birdies on the first hole or somehow, you know, uh, getting a base hit in a major league game. It's, it's not easy, and there are people who've been doing it for 20 years who haven't done it as well as he has in one week. While that's going on, behind the scenes we have yet another massive storyline developing. Kesty, walk us through what happened with the Edison Volquez story. Yeah, this one, um, you know, it caught a lot of people by surprise. I don't know if there's misinformation or just dueling information. And, of course, you know, the the storyline of his dad passing. You know, no one wants to – you don't want to be first on a story. You just want to be accurate on a story. And then Escobar left without speaking to reporters. But the best um, source that I've heard today is our Pedro Gomez, obviously bilingual – So he's got the Spanish part down. He travels in baseball circles. So ESPN Deportes, uh, which uh, which is our Spanish-speaking sports network, um, reporting uh, you know overnight and into the morning today uh, that in fact Edinson Valquez did know, was made aware uh, that his father had passed as uh, Edinson was making his way into the ballpark. So that's the information that we have of now is that you know he. Probably, I would think, would dedicate the game to his dad. And uh, it's remarkable that anybody, you know, could compose themselves on such a big stage and uh, get through the six innings as he did yesterday. ESPN's Mark Kastasher with Armin and Levac on 104.5 The Team. Yeah, Mark, you've been in this business for a while. What is the proper etiquette? You know, it's hard. I'll take this back. You know, it's funny. um, When I worked in Albany Radio for all those years, the first thing I thought of was I was broadcasting University of Albany basketball games in uh, 1996. 
And I remember doing a game in New Hampshire, and uh, it wasn't my father passing, but my grandfather died um, the day of one of my broadcasts on the road. And my wife called into the radio station and had them communicate, um, you know, here's what happened. Please don't tell him until after the game. And then after the game ends, please tell him to call home, which I did. And then uh, promptly, you know, drove home. And I, I, I forget who filled in for me, but, um, you know, all those details were made while the game was going on. To me, that seems the proper etiquette, um, but yet, you know, it, it's immediate family. I don't know what I would want to know. I, I think it would be very difficult. It also depends on location, too. I mean, how soon could he get to the Dominican Republic, you know, if he left right away? Are there people there that can take care of things? So it all depends on situation. Um, but that, that, I just remember that happening to me, and that's probably how I would – uh, how I would want to approach it. How concerned should we be with, with Familia? He blows his first save in, if, I think it's, what, 17 years or something like that? It's that, ridiculous. That, that's what it feels like. I mean, you know, uh, look, the guy wasn't supposed to be the starter when the season began. Uh, he's definitely uh, grown into that role. And then ever since that home run, he gave up to Justin Upton in the rain the day before they acquired Cespedes. Uh, you know, he's been virtually impossible to hit. Freddie Freeman got him. Uh, in September in a tied game, and then that was the first blown save uh, you know he's had since July. So um, I asked Chris Singleton last night after the game for a snap reaction. You know, is it how important is it for him to get back out on the mound tonight? You know, with a lead and get it done. He felt it wasn't a big deal. He thinks Familia's got this thing down. He's going to turn the page. He's going to have that short-term memory that those closers need. Uh, and the Mets better hope so because the bullpen is suspect, although you know they put up a lot of zeros there up into the 14th inning, as did Kansas City. But if, you know, if they have a one- or a two-run lead against this Kansas City team that you just can't seem to put away, uh, you know they're going to have to with Familia leading the way. ESPN Radio's Mark Cassis sure cover, covering the World Series uh, throughout right here on 104.5 The Team. ESPN Radio, whose bullpen is in better shape after 14 innings last night, Mark? I would probably still go with Kansas City. I think from a short term, nobody really blew it out as far as the back end of the bullpen. Obviously, there's some concern, um, you know, if they need length. Uh, I mean, they still have Chris Medlin. I'm speaking about the Royals. Chris Young sounds like it's still good for the game four start, even though he went three innings yesterday. Um, you know, so neither team uh, overused the part of their bullpen that they want to. Wade Davis only threw one inning uh, for the Mets. You know, Clipper didn't quite get through the eighth, but they got a couple of um, from outs from him. So the guys they need to set up, I think, are okay. Um, but if, if they need some long guys, obviously Cologne at his age, it feels like he can just, you know, throw forever, I guess. I don't know. With, with his body type and, and the way he could still throw and at his age, I guess I should throw nothing past him. Uh, but I wouldn't suspect he'd be available tonight. And obviously Chris Young's not going to pitch again until game four. Kesty, when you, when you look at tonight's game, the battle of the true aces, uh, Jacob deGrom versus Johnny Cueto, uh, how, how does this play out to you? What are the key matchups that, that you are looking for? I mean, this to me seems like the perfect spot for Degrom. I know uh, you know his numbers have been awesome in the postseason. He didn't have you know pinpoint control in his start against the Cubs, but uh, as you know, as he's been super good, I think he's in a perfect spot here. For me, the the storyline of the game has got to be Johnny Cueto. I know the home road splits are way better for home. That's why they're setting up for games two and six if necessary. Uh, but you still don't know what you're going to get. From Cueto, uh, he was really good in that game five start. Um, he was not so good in the start up in Toronto. He seemed to get a little bit rattled when the strike zone um, shrunk on him, and, and I agree with him. I, I think he really got um, he got a harsh judgment by the umpire on some of those uh, balls that were called in that three run seventh inning. Uh, but to me, it's Cueto. It all comes down to Cueto. He pitches. Uh, I have uh, no doubt DeGrom will pitch well, but that is a lengthy lineup. There's really nowhere to breathe at all, one through nine, and, for, and, and it's a real tough park um, to pitch in against those guys. Cassie, it just feels like the Royals won't die, doesn't it? It does. I mean, that's why when I think of last year, I know the Giants had kind of that similar karma, 
And I'm thinking, how did they lose last year? How they not the winning the tying run was at third base, ninth inning, two outs, game seven. Of course they're going to tie it, and of course they're going to win it, and they didn't. And uh, you know, it's it's easy to forget because the Giants made three of those runs in five years, and so they were equally the same. Um, but it it does feel really hard. I think the series will change a bit when it gets to New York. Um, the lineup changes for Kansas City without the DH. Uh, the pitching probably favors the Mets in games three and four in the National League Park. And uh, whoever would have thought that City Field would be uh, the small dimension ballpark, uh, but against Kansas City in the way uh, that ballpark plays this time of year, it just might. Gilderland native Mark Kastasher of ESPN Radio covering the World Series for you as a studio host throughout. And tonight, Chris Archer is going to be with him. Hey! We'll be listening to that one. Uh, Casty, thanks so much, man. I always enjoy uh, catching up with you, especially a Gilderland native yourself. Thanks for supporting us here in the 518. Always appreciate you, man. I'll make sure I send uh, love your way to Chris. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. And maybe 1-800-Flowers, I think, is the way to go. I'm, I'm, not... I'm just going to go XOXO. We'll okay. see if that yeah. does. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. He'll never come to New York again. <laughs> All right, guys. We'll talk to you soon.